Welcome to Water of Life Online. We are so glad that you are tuning in for today's message. And you know, here at Water of Life, we believe in having passion for God and compassion for people. And so we're so glad that you're with us today. For more information about our church, from our service times, to the ministries we have available and more, you can check out our website at wateroflifecc.org. And of course, if you wanna stay connected with us throughout the week, make sure you follow us on our different social media platforms. Well, we're so glad that you're here. We hope that God speaks to you, that he encourages you, and we hope that you are blessed by today's message. A couple of things really quick. Easter is two weeks away. That is an amazing thing to say. It's like we're still in the middle of winter, right? This is like, no. A um, couple of things about Easter, though, really important, that we ask you every year to pray about bringing people. Pray about people in your family, in your world, in your school, people that you know in a neighborhood. You need to be praying for people. And then you need to get out of your comfort zone and invite them to church. I know that freaks some of you out, like, no way. Listen, statistics tell us that most people that have never gone to church say that they've never been invited. And so just to get out of your comfort zone and invite somebody, you might be shocked. What happens here at Water of Life at Easter is always amazing. What God does, always amazing. And so we start off on Good Friday, and that's just a really important service around Easter to set your heart before the Lord. We're gonna have prayer on Thursday that week where we walk the whole campus and pray. So if you'd like to join us at six o'clock out on the concourse on Thursday um, before Good Friday, we will pray over the whole campus. We also will have Seder dinner going on that week. We've got all kinds of things going on, but I wanna encourage you to pray for your friends and your family. And then secondly, we need some of you to text 818-818 and just put in serve. We need help in hospitality. We need help with children's ministry. And it's so important for you to understand that none of this can happen without you. If you don't get in and, you know, there are going to be thousands and thousands of people here. Somewhere between fifteen and 20,000 people will come on our campus on Easter weekend. And um, we can't do it without you. And so I want to encourage you, some of you, to get out of your comfort zone and uh, make a difference. Quickly, this last thing would be Chris Annunziato is headed back to Uganda tomorrow, I think tomorrow or Tuesday, and he's out in the concourse. So if you'd like to pray with Chris or visit with him, talk to him before he flies back to Uganda, uh, that is your opportunity is after service. So, Father, we want to come to you right now. As Jacob just said, we want you, Holy Spirit, to speak to us. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see, Lord. When sometimes we're just deaf and blind. We don't hear, we don't see. We pray for revelation today that you would open up the eyes of our heart, God, and help us to yield to you to let you be the Lord of our life, the king of our journey. Father, that you would bring a, an end to the chaos and an end to the desperation and healing to those deep broken places in us and just move us down the road in the journey of destiny of what you wanna do with us, God. So we just thank you for that. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move in Jesus' name. Everybody said, okay, got a Bible, an iPad, a phone. We're gonna be in Genesis chapter 17 and the book of Judges in chapter six, so you could like find both of those places, put your finger in there, and we will visit those places. We're gonna uh, finish this, this week, we're gonna talk about two more names of God, and then we're gonna finish this series up on Easter um, with the name of Jesus, obviously, because how many know Jesus' name is the name above every name, all names, so we'll finish up there, but this is a seven-part series on the names of God, and we've been in the Old Testament talking about some compound names the last couple of weeks. We talked about Jehovah Jireh, and a lot of you are like, I know that name, but when you really find out what it means, some of you didn't know the name. So Jehovah, we talked about that name as well, and really that's the four letters, uh, Y-H-W-H, and it's what we call a tetragrammaton, and it is really um, transliterated is in your Bible as Lord, L-O-R-D, capital letters. And so it's like the Lord uh, Yahweh is what the, the word we use in place of that. But Yahweh, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh comes out of that word Yahweh. And 
uh, when we say Jehovah Jireh, it literally means that God is my provider. But we taught that a few weeks ago. We said to you, it, it means that God sees you. And because God is so amazing, when he sees you, he does what? He provides for you. He helps you. And, and some of you are like, I need provision. You know, I need God to help me. Well, that's what's amazing about the names of God is they expose the character of God and they help you get the, a handle on who is God. Now, one of the things that happens with the names of God we've covered the last few weeks is whenever God brings revelation, it's often in desperate times. Have you ever noticed that about God in your own life? When you get really desperate, then God shows up. And you're like, why don't you just show up all the time? And he's like, no, it's going to happen when you're desperate, you know, when it gets really hard. And some of you are there right now. You're here because you're desperate. And as, as much as you hate it, and I think we all, none of us like to be in a desperate place. But the truth is, it's a really good place. Now, there's a huge difference between desperate and despairing. Despairing has, is like desperation with no hope. But when you say desperate in Christ, that is way different. It means I'm, I'm like dying, God help me, help me, but I have hope that God is gonna show up and do what? And help me, that God's gonna do something. So that was the story of Jehovah Jireh. That was Abraham in Genesis 22. We talked about that. He was supposed to sacrifice his son and God made a provision right away and said, you don't need to do that. That's not gonna ever happen. And then last week we talked about another compound word, Jehovah Rapha. And Jehovah Rapha, the word Rapha literally means a healer, that God is our healer. God is our healer. God wants to put people back together. He wants to restore you and bring life back to you. So we covered all that last week. And again, that came out of a really desperate situation of when, when God had to show up and bring healing. And the word today, the, the, the two words we're going to, the names we're going to cover today, El Shaddai and Jehovah Shalom are both this sim very similar. A lot of times God brings revelation in desperate days, in desperate times, and that's what happened here. So when we start to pick this up, you, you gotta understand the story of a guy named Abram who became Abraham. Uh, many of you know the story, so I don't wanna bore you to death, but let me give you a little background if you don't. It starts in like Genesis chapter 12. God made a promise to this guy, and he told him he would be a blessing to the nations. And then out of him, he would bless the nations of the world. And Abraham was a very interesting guy because the New Testament says that he is the father of our faith. That literally, he is a guy who was the first person that really believed God. And it says it was reckoned to him or, or went into his account as righteousness. That he didn't do this. Here, here's what most of us do. I think I can be good and God will like me more. Or I'm going to work harder and God's going to be happier with me. Abraham was the first person in the Bible who really figured out that is not how this works. How this works is you're God, I'm not, I trust you, you help me. That's how it works. The New Testament puts it this way. It says by faith you are saved, right? Through gra it's by, by the grace of God you're saved to faith that it's not of yourselves. It's a, just a free gift from God. And so Abraham figured that out that the grace of God comes by faith, and he just opened up and he said, look, and I'm gonna trust you, even though, listen, this is so important, I don't get what you're doing. I don't understand what you're about. I don't get, but I know this about you, and this is what's so important. I know your character. You are a good, good God, so I can trust you even if I don't like what you're doing. That's how faith is supposed to work, friends, and that's what happened with this guy named Abraham. So. What God did here, he tested this guy several times, but back in the story where we're gonna pick up this name El Shaddai, what happened is he was promised he was gonna have a son, but he was a super old guy. So he's like, this is never gonna happen. He was hard pressed to believe. And you get into chapter 16 after he was promised that he's gonna be a blessing to the world and the nations of the world and literally you're gonna be blessed to become a blessing and that's what God wants all of us to be. But then nothing happened. And have you ever felt like God promised you something and then what? Nothing happened. <laughs> and you're like, well, are you going to do something? Yeah. How many of you know this is how it got? Yeah. It's coming. Well, for this poor guy, it came 25 years later. So if you've been waiting for five minutes, hang on. You know, I mean, 25 years, you're like, whoa, for real, serious. Yeah, he was 75 when he first got the promise. He was 100 when he got the kid. And that's what makes the story so difficult because whenever in the middle of this, in chapters 15 and 16 of Genesis, you get a picture of desperation, but then they make a decision like you and I have, you've done this. I mean, we, we've all done this. I think I need to help God. 
He must have forgot that he promised. I, I, haven't you ever done this? I mean, you thought for sure God wanted this thing to happen. It was gonna, and, he, and you know, it was like, wait on me, wait on the Lord, trust me. And you're like, okay, I got it. And then, uh, you know, six months goes by and you go, I, I, I don't got it anymore. I, I need you to do this. Oh, I got it. Now, you need me to help you. Yeah, how many of you have thought like this before? I mean, we all have. But friends, everybody in the room has thought like this. You may not have been conscious of it, but when you get tired of waiting for God, then you immediately start to think this, he needs some help. Now, there's a theological term for people when we think like this. What is it? It's stupid. I mean, God doesn't ever need my help. My help always creates chaos. How about you? Uh, the answer is yes, your help. God does not need your help. But, but, but we think he does, especially when we start to get desperate. And so, particularly for, for when we bought this property, we bought this property three different times. Now, in this story, in this story, what happens with Abram is he makes a decision, he's desperate, and he's doubting, he's questioning God, he can't see what's happening, just like us, he's human. And so he and his wife come up with a deal, a plan. The plan is, listen, get the maid girl pregnant and she'll have the boy that we need because we've never been able to have kids. And God obviously needs some help in this thing because we waited for 25 years and we haven't had a baby. Hello? How many of you know you've thought just like this? You, you, you have. Now, your plan might have looked way different. I'm not saying that you got the maid girl pregnant. I'm not saying that, no. no. I'm saying that you thought like that. Like you thought God needs some help. We need to help get this ball to roll down the road. We gotta make this happen. And, and see, the exact same thing happened when we bought this property. And, so, and, and, and the baby that was born for Abraham and Hagar, the maid, his name was Ishmael. So you gotta always think, Ishmael was not the promise of God. Isaac was, his other son that came later. But, but how many know later's harder? Hello? And later is by faith and earlier wasn't. And so the Bible talks about all this and we're not gonna go into all that today, but I know whenever we bought this property, we bought it and lost it and bought it and lost it and finally the third time we owned it. But by the third time, I, I was like uh, Abram there. I was like, I think God needs some help here. You know, we had so much pressure, we needed a building so bad, we needed land so bad, we were like hemorrhaging people all over the place, we had nowhere to go, we had no, no everybody's like, hurry up and get us a place, and I'm like, you know, come on God, you know, and a year goes by, and eight more months go by, and pretty soon, I got a great idea. I think what we should do is leave the property on East Avenue, and just go buy Kmart. So we did. You never knew that, did you? You know Kmart over on Foothill and Haven? We bought Kmart. And so, so we went into escrow on Kmart, and it was, a, it was an awesome idea. <laughs> you know, we were gonna put an atrium in, we got plans drawn, and we were gonna take the middle of it out and put a big courtyard in the middle. It was gonna be really awesome. And then one day when we were praying about it, you know, we had put 50,000 down on it and it was gonna go hard. That means the money's gonna like disappear if you know, it's, you get down the escrow far enough. And I'm praying about it and the, and the Lord just as clear as day said to me, this is an Ishmael, would you please let it go? I mean, clear as day, I'll never forget it. This is Ishmael, let this go. And I'm like, Lord, this is not Ishmael. You need some help here. Like, we've been stuck here for three years and we can't just stay here. I mean, you gotta help us. So we're gonna, you know, and clear as day, this is an Ishmael. So fortunately for me, though I am S-T-U-P-I-D, I was able to get our money back and get out of it, and it was just a few weeks later that we got the phone call, and the guy had told us, there's no chance you're ever gonna own this property, none whatsoever, and he called us up, and again, he was desperate, and God had shifted all the circumstances, and we bought the property for a million dollars less than we were gonna buy it before, okay? So that was what God had spoken to us that was gonna happen, but the truth was, the longer you wait, the more you don't believe. Hello? How many of you know what I'm talking about? When the waiting gets really hard, it's hard to believe. And so here you got this picture of this guy, and he's, and he's like, I, I think I need to help God, and God's like, I don't need your help. I got this, you just need to be still and you need to just wait. Well, his wife was pressuring him, there was all kinds of things going on. 25 years have gone by, 
25 years. So now, let's pick up the story. Chapter 17, verse 1. And if you're online on one of our other campuses, we want to welcome you, but let's read this loud and together. Genesis 17, 1. It says, Now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Now, Abram means an honorable father, and Abraham in Hebrew means a father of nations. And so God literally did what, he, what, the, what we've been studying. He changed his name to meet his nature and his character. And what God was going to do is prophetic. It became a picture of who the guy was. So his name became Abraham. Now, here's the problem with the story. He's 100 years old, 99. He's waited 25 years, and now God says you're going to have a son. Now, a bunch of you immediately are sitting out there going, I don't believe this. No, I, I get it that. And you're like, this is exactly why I don't go to church. That's what you're gonna say when you go to lunch today. They tell stupid stories like this, like some 100-year-old guy's gonna get his wife pregnant, you know? And you want me to believe that. No, 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 actually, I don't really care if you believe that. Here's what I want you to believe. That Jesus walked on the water. That Jesus raised the dead. That Jesus died went into the grave and got back out. See, that's a little bit harder to believe than a 100-year-old guy having a baby. But here's the truth. God has done this throughout time and history on purpose because God sets up the laws of nature intentionally violating them to make a point, and the point is, I'm God. I can do whatever I want. I don't care how old you are. You can have a baby if I decide you can have a baby. I don't care if you can't walk on the water. I can walk on the water because I made the water. I don't care if you die and never come out of the grave. I can get out of the grave because I'm God and I'm more powerful than death. That is the picture of the Bible, friends. That is the miraculous. When you just think about miracles, just think like this. Miracles are often a violation of the laws of nature. They're a violation of laws of nature, things that are just so obvious and scientific that we just say, that can't happen. And God says, oh yeah, 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 it can't happen for you, but it can happen for me. That's why I'm God and you're not. So, if you don't believe the story, we'll just keep going. Okay, so watch this, because this is a really great name. The first time that this name El Shaddai is ever used is when in verse one, where he says, Abram's 99 years old and the Lord appeared to him and he said, I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. So here, here's what we said. We studied this a few weeks ago. Elohim, the word El means a powerful God. And so El Shaddai literally means a God who's a creator, powerful and, and very mighty. That's what the name El Shaddai means. Like, I created this world, I created nature, I can do whatever I want. I, I'm not bound by your age, Abram. I'm not bound by Sarah's age. I'm not bound by any of those things that bind you. I can do, I am God Almighty, I can do whatever I want. So, so, so he gives this guy a name change, says, listen, not only are you gonna have a son, you're gonna be the father of many nations, it's gonna proliferate throughout time in history because I made a deal with you. It's called a covenant. That was chapter 12 when he made a deal with the guy and said, I'm going to bless you to become a blessing. Now that covenant stood all the way up to Jesus. And then Jesus said, remember when he did communion? Jesus said, this is a new covenant in my blood. He was actually saying this, the covenant with Abraham just ended and a covenant with me now started. You fortunately live under that. You live under the covenant of Jesus' blood. If you're a Jesus follower, that means that he washes away your sin. So you don't have to make a sacrifice like Abram had to do. God has already, already, already taken care of all that for you. That's, we're gonna celebrate that at Easter. But, but, but let's keep going because this is really important. You pick up El Shaddai. Why did God make this declaration? In the midst of desperation. The guy's like, 
at his wits end. He's like, I can't do anymore. I've trusted you, I've trusted you. You haven't done anything. You haven't done anything. And that's when so often, we said this the last couple of weeks, in the middle of the wilderness, in the middle of the darkness is when God does some of his best work. It's the hardest time for you, hardest time for me, but it's the best time for God to get a hold of us. We hate that. I get that, friends. I totally get that. But all over the scriptures, you find this in the Bible, everywhere, that God does some of his greatest work in our most desperate days. And so if you're here today and you're in that place, I want to tell you, you need to believe God to show up in desperation that God will show up. So, so here's Elohim. You know, El, El Ohim, El is a singular form of Elohim, and it speaks of God as this powerful, almighty God. Moses used it, the, the, this name when he said this in Deuteronomy 3.24. He said, what El is there in the heavens of the earth that can do according to your works and according to your might? And he was referencing parting the Red Sea. Like, there's no other God who, who actually can violate the laws of nature. Only you can do that. You've shown that over and over and over. Who could part an ocean? Only you. That's what Moses is referencing here. It's an amazing picture. It's the same thing of Jesus when he walked on the water and everybody went, it's a ghost, it's a ghost. He goes, no, it's just me. I can do this, you know. I can walk on water. Actually, if you ever come to Israel with us, I walk on the Sea of Galilee, on the water of the Sea of Galilee every time we go there, so I can show that to you, but that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> now, oh, yeah, okay. So let, let, let's talk about this because what's so great about El Shaddai is the word is used 48 times in the Old Testament and derivatives of it 24 other times. But here's the real picture. This is what's so great about the name. The root word of Shaddai is Shad in Hebrew. And the word Shad is, means breast. And why would God use that word in this picture? Because it's a picture of nourishment. It's a picture of God caring for people and feeding people and taking care of people. And friends, anytime you find these character pictures of God throughout the Bible, you can always go to Jesus and say, did he do that? And didn't Jesus do that? What did Jesus say? I am the bread of what? Life. I'm the bread of life. If you eat from me, you'll get life. If you eat from the sewage, you get death. You know, I am the river of living water, Jesus said. If you drink from me, you get hope and possibility. But if you drink from the cesspool, you die. And that's the picture throughout scripture. Jesus said exactly the same thing. Remember when he blew people up and he said this, listen, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Remember when he said that? And they went, what the heck? What, are you a psycho or what? Who says something like that? And what was he really saying? I want to nourish you. I have life. You don't have it. You need what I've got, and I am here to feed you. That's the picture of El Shaddai. Mighty God that can control the nature, do all these things, but I am still here to nurture and, and nourish you. I want to feed you. I want to take care of you. I want to help you. So it's a, it's a great picture. Now, when, and, and by the way, if that like some of you are troubled, you need to figure this out. There's pictures of God as a, as a female all over in the Old Testament. And some of you are like, oh, are you going to write me an email tomorrow? But, you know, it, 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 just go to Isaiah 49, 15, and God says, I'm as, I'm as a mother to you. I'm as a mother to you. I, I care for you. God, listen, men and women are made in the image of God. Hello? Some of, ladies, come on, please help me. All right, thank you. This is your chance, and you're all sitting there like this. You've got to speak up, girls, when you've got a chance. Okay, so... I'm playing with you. Listen, what, what, what's so great about this name? You find it in places of desperation, should I? All over the Bible, and Job. We're gonna study Job in the next few weeks. You find this word, this name, El Shaddai, used over and over and over in the book of Job. Why? Because there's desperation. What, what is it about? It means this, your father is a storehouse of hope, but you gotta go to the storehouse and feed there. The other place that this, that this name is used is, is with Joseph. You know, Joseph, when his father prophetically spoke about Joseph, and, and, and you look at Joseph and what his dad said about him, literally he said, you are a fruitful bow. You are like El Shaddai. He used that word for Joseph. But, but, but hold it, think about Joseph's life. In prison, in jail, if you don't know the story of Joseph, he like 13 years of really hard time, all to get him in a place where he could feed everybody else. It's a prophetic picture. 
that he could take care of other people. And that's El Shaddai. So when, when you get into this, you start to see it, and you go, wow, look at what God has done. Well, look at what God can do. What, what does God want to do with you? Listen to Psalm 91. Because not only is El Shaddai a nourisher and a feeder of people, he's your refuge and your hope. Psalm 91 says it this way. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of El Shaddai. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap, protect you from every deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers and he will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and your protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors by night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in the darkness, nor the disaster that strikes in midday. Though a thousand people would fall at your side, though 10,000 would die around you, those evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near you. You know, you know what's so amazing about that? is God makes these crazy promises and we don't take them. Some of you right now are in such desperate places. There's chaos everywhere inside of you because you don't believe that God is your refuge, that God will feed you. You think this, I have to feed myself. And I totally get that. I mean, that's why I told you I went down and bought Kmart. But when God starts to correct you, friends, you need to receive correction. What's so amazing about God is when you get desperate, when you pull away and the chaos gets so loud, and then you cry out to him, he still comes. Hello, he still comes. If I was God, I wouldn't come. I'd just say, you know, you're all on your own, you wanted to go by yourself, see you later. You know? No, but what's so amazing about God is he's like, I still love you. Even though you turned away from me, I still love you, I wanna help you. Let me feed you. Let me give you refuge. Let me nourish you. It's such an amazing, amazing picture of this, of this, Jehovah Shalom. It's this thing. Jehovah Shalom literally means he's a God of peace. Anybody need some peace? I mean, come on, you live in a world of chaos. It's just crazy all the time. It's crazy all the time. And here God says this, not am I, I'm not only El Shaddai who wants to feed you, nourish you, give you refuge, I am your peace. Didn't Jesus say that? Yeah. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage, I've overcome the world. Yeah. And I will give you peace. I mean, Paul said the same thing in the book of Philippians. He said, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything come and pray and trust me. Yeah. Be anxious for nothing because I will give you a peace that passes what? Understanding, no, 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 but, but please think about this. I will give you peace. That means your circumstances might not change, but you can be safe in the middle of them. That's what's so amazing about God, until he does change them. Is that he said, he's made you promise, I'll give you peace in the middle of the pressure. Instead, we are like, no, I'll take the chaos and I'll fix it myself. <laughs> really? I'll take the care, and, and then you're desperate, you're dying, and you're like, why doesn't God show up? Here's the answer, because you don't let him. You, you gotta figure this out, friends. You got to let God rule over you. When the king rules over you, the chaos goes away. Amen. Now, 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 here's a lot of you like this, like, I don't want anybody ruling over me, I'm an American. <laughs> no, no, that's what, how we think, you know? You know, this is a democracy. <laughs> Heaven is not a democracy. Let me help you with that. You do not get a vote. Not, you know, there's no democracy in heaven. But, but, but there is a God who is crazy about you, who loves you and wants to help you, heal you and restore you. But, but you gotta figure this out. Many of us don't ever get rid of the chaos because we never come to grips with the reality of what God wants from us. We're probably this summer gonna do a study on the kingdom of God again. I've been teaching this for a year all over the place at School of Ministry. I was in Cambodia teaching, teaching to the staff here. And, and one of the things that is, as Christians, what we don't get, if I just said this to you, what is the kingdom of God? 
Most of you go, I don't know. Church. <laughs> no, church is not the kingdom of God. <clears throat> you know, we don't know what the kingdom of God is, but do you know that Jesus used the, the word kingdom of God over a hundred times in the New Testament? And we don't even know what it means. So, because here's why. Because we, we don't preach the gospel of kingdom. We preach the gospel. What does that mean? The gospel means good news. So when you start to talk to somebody about Jesus, this is what you say. God loves you, man. He's crazy about you. Pastor Dan says it every week. He loves you so much. You know, he died and he rose from the dead and he'll forgive you if you'll just come to him and trust him. He wants to be your very best friend all the time. Say it. Sounds good, doesn't it? There's a problem with it. That isn't what Jesus taught. No, Jesus didn't teach that. You gotta get this. He didn't teach that. The Bible says Jesus taught the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is a bit different than the gospel. Because the gospel of the kingdom has a what? King. <laughs> we have one person over here figured this out, right? <laughs> He'd been in the last four services. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, 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 listen. The kingdom, all kingdoms have a king. They have a king who rules in the kingdom. So here's what Jesus taught, and this is gonna trouble some of you. Jesus didn't teach, I just love you and want relationship with you. He taught this, there is a God and it's not you. Amen. When you let him rule over you, then you come into intimate relationship with him. And the reason some of you don't have intimate relationship with God is because you don't let him rule over you. So when he comes and says, listen, I can clean up the chaos. No thanks. I can fix your brokenness. No, I got it. No, I love Jesus, but I'll take care of myself. No, some of you are just like this. Come on, be real. That's how you think. I don't need God to be in control. I need to be in control. I trust myself more than I trust God. And see, it, when you do that, you need to understand fundamentally, you remove yourself underneath his covering. And you don't have intimacy with God. You don't have deep relationship with God. The only way you get deep relationship, and, and sometimes people are like this, I don't have any authority with God. I don't ever feel the Holy Spirit move through me. Listen, authority comes out of intimacy. Authority is always born. You get intimate with God, and you'll find your intimacy turns into authority and anointing. Intimacy turns into authority but you gotta have intimacy. And, and here's what Jesus taught. I love you, I'm crazy about you, and all of my relationship with you comes out of my ruling over you. Because I love you so much, I need to bring correction and healing to your life. But you have to let me. Now that's why Jesus, the Bible teaches this. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the what? Humble, to the humble. You gotta bow your heart before your maker. Friends, you gotta figure this out. So when you get to a place like, like Jehovah Shalom, and you're sitting there going, man, I want inner peace. I'm struggling with anxiety, pain, regret, disappointment, drama every day. I mean, you live in a world that's just full of drama. It's like an enemy for all of us. Anxiety. We're the most anxious group of people that have ever been on planet Earth, ever. Ever, because there's too much information, friends. You have too much access to too much information. You can't manage it inside, and it blows you up. But, 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 but listen, it doesn't blow Jehovah Shalom up. He is the God of peace. So let's talk about Shalom for a minute, because it's an interesting word. In Hebrew, if you go to Israel, uh, they greet each other every day, Shalom, 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 Shalom. And, and Shalom doesn't mean peace, just peace. It means wholeness. That your peace comes through God putting you back together and creating wellness inside of you and wholeness. It's a, like a big picture of the peace of God comes through the wholeness of God touching your life. And so when you say shalom, you're not just saying, hey, I hope you have some peace today. No, no, I mean, that was us when we grew up, right? Peace out, dude, you know, like, <laughs> you old people, y'all remember that, right? Yeah, yeah. But, 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 but that's not what shalom means. Shalom means this. Let me put you back together. Let me feed you, nourish you, help you. Let me have my way in you and you will be way happier because you were created for me. You're created for me. So watch this. When you start to go into the Lord of peace, that's Jehovah Shalom, you really find this, the first picture in the most chaotic time in the world, in, 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 in the history of Israel. 
in the book of Judges. So if you've got your Bible, your iPad, your phone, turn there quickly and we'll wrap this up in Judges chapter six. This is when you find, in the midst of this chaos, you find this name, Jehovah Shalom. Now, let me read to you from Isaiah 57 and it'll help clarify what happens when you live in the chaos and why it's so chaotic. It says in, in, in Isaiah 40, or 57, 21, it says, but the wicked are storm-battered seas that cannot quiet down the waves that stir up so much garbage and mud. There's no peace, God says, for those who are wicked. Now you might be sitting there going, I'm not wicked. I just don't want God to rule over me. <laughs> no, no, you gotta figure this out. That's called rebellion. That's what it's called in the Bible, it's rebellion. That's the whole story of Israel. We love God, just leave us alone. And God's like, I'm not gonna leave you alone. I created you, you're my people. I'm crazy about you. I need relationship with you, I want relationship with you. He doesn't need it, but he wants it. And the truth is, you need it. I need it more than he needs it. So, so here's judges, full of chaos, because they resist God. They're, they're like this. They're like, they, in, in the book of Judges, the people would like mess up really bad, then they would repent, and it would get really hard, they would like get disciplined by God, and then they would come back and they would go, okay, we're really sorry, we're gonna worship you, and that lasts for five minutes, and they do it again. It's just like some of you. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I love God. It's good for five minutes, you know. I get out of here. Monday, Tuesday's good. By Wednesday, I'm in hell again, and it's by Thursday, Friday, Sunday. I'm back ready to God do something new again, okay? Because I'm desperate. But, but, but you're not supposed to be like that. You're not supposed to live like that. So watch, watch what happens. You got your Bible, your iPad, your phone. It's a desperate situation. Verse one and two in chapter six of Judges. It says that the Israelites, just so you understand, it says at the end of Judges that everybody did what was right in their own eyes. It was chaotic. So it says the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord delivered them in the power of Midian for seven years so that the Midians would hold Israel as subjects. From fear of Midian, the Israelites, they would even make dens in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. They were so afraid of them. So when you go to verse six, it says that they were brought very low. So Israel, verse six, says brought very low because of Midian. The sons of Israel, in desperation, cried out to the Lord. And they cried out to the Lord on account of Midian. And the Lord sent them a prophet, a guy named Gideon. And so Gideon has a visitation down in verse 11 from the angel of the Lord, which is probably Jesus. And, it's, and it says that he visited him. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him. And down in verse 13, uh, Gideon says to him, oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? That's exactly what some of you think. God, if you love me, why is it so chaotic? Why, is it, why am I so hurt? Why has, have I lost so much? And listen to what he says. Where are all the miracles that our fathers told us about? They told us the Lord brought us up out of Egypt and he'd done all these wild things, but now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Some of you feel that right now. Like the Lord has abandoned me. He doesn't love me. He doesn't really care what happens to me. No, 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 he's crazy about you. Is it hard? It's hard, you're desperate. But he's crazy about you. That's the picture here. So it says the Lord looked at him and said, go, go in your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? And he says, how can I deliver Israel? And he said, I'm gonna do this supernatural thing with you. And then if you drop down, way down to verse 22, something starts to happen. Gideon makes an altar to the Lord and he brings him an offering to, to worship him. But down in verse 22, it says, when Gideon saw that the, this was the angel of the Lord, he said, alas, O Lord God, for now I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Again, literally, most likely, Jesus. The Lord said to him, peace to you, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. Then Gideon built an altar to the Lord and he named it Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Shalom. When, in the middle of a huge crisis of desperation, friends, some of you need to figure this out. God has peace for you that is not tied to your circumstances. Your circumstances look horrible. Everything you see with your eye looks horrible. And God says, I can still do this. Amen. You got to trust me. I can still do this. I can do what you can't see. I can put you back together. I can give you well-being. I can give you wholeness. That's shalom. I can make you complete and full where you're just desperate today. 
but you have to come to me and bow your heart before me. Shalom is literally a peace that passes understanding. Jesus, I quoted already John 16, 33. These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you're gonna have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 8, 5 about this peace. For those who live according to the flesh, their own mind, their own way, and are concerned only with the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit are concerned about the things from the Holy Spirit. The concern of the flesh is death, but the concern of the Spirit is life and peace. That's what I've been trying to say to you the whole time. You gotta trust God, allow the Spirit to work in you now. Listen to Philippians, Paul wrote this in to a letter to these people in a place called Philippi. He said this, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Listen to these words. And the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Hold, hold, hold it, hold it. The peace of God surpasses understanding. What does that mean? It means you cannot figure this out. Are you still in chaos? Yeah, are you still in, in, in a desperate place? Yeah. But God's peace is greater than that. When you yield to him, his peace comes into the middle of the chaos, in the middle of the desperation, and he begins to rescue you. And you're like, I, I don't know why I feel so much better. Even though I should be desperate, I'm not. Now, now think about this. That song that you sang a little while ago, It Is Well With My Soul. Anybody here know the story of that song? Hello? Two of you, yeah. Let me tell you the story of that song. That song was written by a guy named Horatio Spafford. He had a wife and four kids, and he was a businessman in Chicago. He actually had a wife and five kids at the beginning of the story. He bought a bunch of land when he was a young businessman. He was an attorney, made some money, bought a bunch of land on Lake Michigan. And most of you don't know about this, but there was a fire in 1871 in Chicago. It was called the Great Fire of Chicago. Burned the whole city down almost. And D.L. Moody had a church there in those days and he traveled the world for two years and raised money to rebuild his church. And this guy actually knew Moody. The guy who wrote the song, It Is Well With My Soul. But this guy lost everything in the fire. All of his investments burned to the ground. And the next year, his son died of pneumonia. And so he had made plans to go to Europe to work with D.L. Moody and some other people on a business deal in Europe and raise money for Moody to rebuild his church. And he got hung up on a business deal just before he was supposed to sail away. So he told his wife and his four daughters, I want you to go ahead of me and I'll meet you in England as soon as I'm done. I'll take the next ship like in four days, five days later and I'll be right behind you guys and I'll see you in England. Let me read you the story. Four days into crossing the Atlantic, the ship that his wife and four children was on collided with an iron hulled Scottish ship called the Loch Urn. Suddenly, everybody on board was in grave danger. Anna, his wife, hurriedly brought her four children up onto the deck where she knelt down with them and began to pray that God would spare them if it would be his will, or at least make them willing to endure whatever awaited them. Within 12 minutes, the ship they were on slipped beneath the dark waters of the Atlantic, killing 226 of the 313 people on board, including all four of Spafford's children. A sailor rowing a boat over the spot where the ship went down spotted a woman floating, holding onto a piece of the wreckage. It was Anna, his wife, still alive. He pulled her into his boat. They were picked up by another larger vessel and nine days later landed in Cardiff, Wales where she then wired her husband a message that began this way. I alone am saved, what shall I now do? Mr. Spafford later framed that telegram and hung it in his office. Another of the ship survivors, a guy that was a pastor named Weiss, 
Later recalled Anna Spafford saying, God gave me four daughters and now they've all been taken from me. Someday, I hope I understand why. Mr. Spafford, when he found out what had happened to his family, immediately booked passage on the next available ship and left to join his grieving wife. When the ship was four days off into the Atlantic, the captain called Spafford to his cabin and told him, we are right now over the place where your family drowned 10 days ago. According to his oldest daughter, who was born later, she said he went to the stern of the ship and began to write the song, It Is Well With My Soul. Now, you know how the song starts? Peace like a river attendeth attendeth my soul. (laughs) Are you kidding? Your four kids just drowned here 10 days ago. And the only way he wrote that song, friends, was because he knew Jehovah Shalom, the peace of God that was greater than all of his circumstances. He ultimately had three more children, one of which died again, and then he took the others and they moved to Jerusalem where he ended up serving the Lord for the rest of his life and he's buried in Jerusalem. But when you hear the song and you know the circumstances, it changes everything. Because I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be writing about a peace that attends my soul. I would be losing my mind if I was sailing over the place that my kids had just drowned 10 days earlier. The only way that that can happen is when Jesus Christ touches you with a peace that passes understanding, human reason, and goes into your heart. And then when you read, when, when, when you read the words and you listen to the words of the song, he starts to talk about how his sin was washed away but, but, but listen, my sorrow like sea billows rolls. So if you're thinking the guy was just okay, he was not okay. But he was able to say this, there's sorrow all over me, but your peace is greater than my sorrow. Some of you need to figure this out right now. You're desperate, you're in chaos, but God's peace is greater. So what we're gonna do right now, as we close up, we're gonna sing this song again. And I want to invite you, if you're in a desperate place and you long for the peace of God in your desperation, just come up and kneel at the front and we'll pray together before we go home. But let's stand and worship together right now. Could you turn my mic on, please? Thank you. Um, Some of you need to think like this right now. I just need to stop you before we go into the song. Because remember this, I ask you to come up and kneel for a reason. Because you gotta make a decision in your chaos. Who's gonna run your life? So Father, I wanna come right now and pray for people that are in desperate places. That they would bow not just their knee, but their heart to you. And say, God, I'm desperate. I don't get what's going on in my life. I can't stand the chaos and the drama. But I believe that you have something greater for me. That you, Holy Spirit, would bring Jehovah Shalom, a peace that passes understanding, to bear on these people, Lord. So again, if that's you, I want to invite you up. Bow your heart down before the Lord.
Father, we come to you right now and cry out to you, Lord. We want to thank you for desperate days. Lord, we hate them, but they're so important in the journey. They're part of our destiny, God, that you allow us to come to the end of ourselves so we can crash into you deeper. And so I ask for the folks that are up here right now, Lord, that are some of them in very, very difficult places, God, where their hearts are broken and they don't see a way out. They don't find an end anywhere. It just looks dark, like a dark tunnel, that you, Holy Spirit, would bring light right now. That you would be that peace that passes our understanding, our rational thinking. That you would break into our hearts, God, and say, I am Jehovah Shalom. I can do what you can't do, trust me. Father, we declare to you today, we trust you. And we bow our hearts before you, we bow our knees before you to say, Lord, I need a God like you who would nourish me, you would feed me, you would care for me, you would give me refuge in the middle of the desperation. And then, Father, you would bring your peace to bear on all my circumstances. So, Father, we ask for your glory to come. We thank you, Father, where you rule, there's no chaos. When you're in control, there's no chaos, Lord. You, you take all that's broken and begin to make it well and heal it, make it complete and whole again. So we ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would touch every heart, every life up here, that you would bring revelation, Lord, dreams and visions, supernatural insight into their situation, into their pain, into their desperation, God, that you would reveal yourself in ways that they've never known you before. Just as you did, God, to Gideon, when he said, where are you? You used to do all these great miracles. Where are you? And you said, I'm still God. I'm still here. So Lord, we wanna say that to you. Where are you in our desperation? Come and declare yourself king again. Show yourself, Father, in our circumstance, in our situation, to be in control. Release your peace. Release your possibility. Release your healing. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I wanna invite all of you on the ministry team, if you would just come up and just begin to walk through and pray over people. We're gonna to continue to worship. We wanna pray over you and pray with you before you go home. Well, wasn't that a great message? You know, I say this all the time, but our hope here is that you wouldn't just receive information, but that you would experience transformation. And so we hope that you were transformed and challenged and encouraged by today's message. Like we mentioned, if you want to find out more ways to get connected to Water of Life, make sure you check out our website, wateroflifecc.org. But other than that, we love you guys. We hope you have a great week, and we can't wait to see you next week at Water of Life.